Welcome to the Reimagine Podcast. Each week, give yourself 30 minutes and meet the people working hard to create the future of insurance today. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and uh, this summer, NASA Reimagine hosted the first annual Retire Tech Forum. And Laura, who came? We had over 100 attendees representing industry decision makers, insure techs, fintechs, and retire tech startups that joined us not only in Hartford, Connecticut, but also virtually. So it was very exciting to see the group of individuals together. You know, it was indeed. And and you organized, was it six panel discussions? Six. Six with over 25 speakers. That's right. It took the, uh, and they took the stage at the forum and explored a number of very interesting issues, including sales and marketing, service and operations, product innovation, risk management, climate risk, and core advisor software. And today we're sharing session four on risk management. We call this keeping more connected seniors safe. And Laura, who was there and what do they talk about? Sure. We had some great speakers from With Secure and University of Hartford. And this panel was a little bit different than the others that you've listened to thus far. We had a a deep fireside chat, as we called it. So to hear the two perspectives going back and forth was was very rich in content. And, you know, the few things that stood out to me um, across the entire event, but it was highlighted in this panel, is really the risk of, of no longer dying too soon, but living too long. And Paul, you and I were speaking the other day, and you mentioned that the first person to live to the age 200 has already been born. And you know that alone will have impacts on the industry. So super curious to hear what is, uh, what's upcoming in the risk management field. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'll be able to remember passwords at age 198. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. We we had a a really good fireside chat. Um, I think one item that really stood out in my my mind is reducing risk doesn't mean truly keep people safe. You think of your house. If somebody really wants to break into your house or your car, what does it take? It takes a a rock or a brick. Um, The challenge here is the assets that they may walk away with are very, very tough um, uh, things to replace, your identity, um, uh, your retirement assets. So stakes are much higher, and um, but the risk is the risk is there. The risk is there. So uh, Laura, anyway, do you want to like you know crank the reel for us? And as we find our seats and and find other beverages, um, I just want to say thanks to everybody who is attending on Zoom. We see you. Um, So, you know, shout out to Novio SE2, Memorial Asset Protection Plan, Engaged Retirement, TCS, Northwestern Mutual, Longevity Funds, CNA Insurance, Silver Bills, and we have a few individuals as well. So thank you all for being there with us on Zoom. Please send in any questions that you may have. We're happy to answer them and engage with you in that way. And without further ado, I will start the session off by introducing our moderator, John Thompson. Good afternoon. This may be the smallest panel of the day. <laughs> You're calling us short, I think. That's <laughs> Actually, actually, I think it, it it may be it may be one of the most dynamic as well. So let's 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 take the optimistic view. So thank. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Thompson. Um, I am um, a um, uh, an aging baby boomer who uh, is um, uh, I think uh, qualified to start to talk about this uh, field of of retirement and what does retirement mean. I thought one of the gentlemen in the last session asked the question about what does retirement look like now? What does it look like in 10 years? What is it gonna look like in 20 years? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what retirement looks like for me. So I think that's probably an answer that's probably consistent with what most consumers would answer that question. Uh, but I think what it, it, it poses a question is it starts to get into this area of risk. So uh, Raj and I are gonna talk today about risk. Uh, so first I'm gonna ask Raj to introduce himself about himself and his company. Yeah, hi, thanks, John. Uh, Raj Patel, I uh, work with a company called With Secure. Uh, it's a, a Finnish-based company. It's a cybersecurity firm. Uh, 
global customers. Um, and my, my roles and responsibilities are around um, cybersecurity engineering. So uh, I work with the sales team. Uh, we cover the North, uh, North America region. Um, and we just basically help customers understand their risk profile when it comes to uh, cybersecurity risk and how they can become compliant, uh, protect against all the different variants out there, all the different malware and stuff like that. So, Great. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I want to begin with how my morning began this morning. At very similar to a lot of mornings. The first thing I do when I get up is find my glasses and then I find my way to the coffee pot. But then the third thing I usually do is to turn on my uh, my mobile phone and and check the emails and so forth. And of course, I always scan the you know the weather and the you know the news headlines, and then I start to look at some of the feeds that I get. And one of the feeds that I get, and I guess it'll show you what kind of a, a nerd I really am, is 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 from a, a organization that focuses on OR management and OR meaning operating room. And uh, I've spent a lot of my career has been spent in the uh, in the healthcare field, uh, among a, a couple of other places. But um, one of the announcements that they made in in this uh, in this feed from this uh, OR management organization was that the average uh, or the life expectancy uh, of, of people has increased yet once again. So for me, it just was like, wow, it's a great thing that happened this morning when I'm coming to this retire tech thing is that we realize that now people are going to be facing um, retirement and are going to be living longer. And, and I can remember back if I talk about my grandfather who was, happened to be a life insurance salesman, uh, he sold life insurance based upon the fact that you needed protection for if you died prematurely and your family had obligations, you had a mortgage, you had children to educate, you needed to have life insurance to protect your family for that. You know, today we start to look at risk and the risks are, are there that's really happening is in a lot of things, it's not really so much dying too soon. The risk now, which is growing and becoming bigger is living too long. And so with the average life expectancy increasing, it means that there's a, a, a larger focus on uh, the insecurity uh, associated with, with, with that longevity. Um, so in Paul's theme this morning, he kind of started talking about the C's that are associated with it. So I thought from retire tech and from uh, area of risk management, we talk about two C's. Uh, the C, another C here we'll talk about is, uh, is, is the consumer or, and the other is sort of the company or corporate perspective. So those are kind of the two C's that I see. Um, so um, the prompt that uh, we, I got from uh, Laura on, on this area of risk management was to talk about the, you know, with uh, uh, older adults and with the pandemic, older adults, adults have become much more proficient at using technology, which is, which is probably true. I think people have, out of necessity, have been forced to understand how they use their their mobile phones or their, or their iPads or their laptops to do more things and to connect and so forth. And I think uh, Paul talked, I think, about older adults who couldn't go to church were actually attending church services via Zoom or, or YouTube, which they probably never turned on before. So they became very familiar with that. But with that, the question was, does that, how does that change how we as, um, as professionals in the area of retirement, and, and I'm not sure whether we, I think we maybe have to come up with a new word for this phase of life because it's becoming a, a significantly longer phase and, and it's looking very different than it has in the past. But it's like, how do we help prepare people and help them manage their way in this latter part of their, of their life, which is a significant period. It's not five years, of typically it's becoming, now time horizons are 25 and 30, 30 years. So I don't know whether I have 25 more years. I probably should plan for having 25 more years or maybe 30 years more, but I may only have 30 minutes more. So who knows? So um, uh, how, how my day is going to go from here. So um, anyway, so we'll talk about the area of risk. And, and I want to harken back to the panel that was just up here because they were very um, uh, articulate about some of these issues. Um, associated with, uh, with, with retirement and, and the consumer's perspective on retirement. And um, uh, one of the great quotes that, uh, is it Awena? 
Evelina from uh, Lincoln um, made, made some very, very good comments, I thought. And, and this, uh, one, of, one of the points that she made was that we really need to provide solutions for consumers and, and the product is not a solution. And I thought that was pretty uh, insightful. And then I thought the idea about technology, technology is not a solution, it, it, it is a tool. And I think Evelina made that, made that um, uh, distinction as well. And I thought that's really appropriate. But I think the area that maybe where we can start to find some, uh, uh, a, an informed way to understand the consumer, the C perspective, is in the area of risk management. And risk management has historically been done and talked about from a C, another C, a corporate perspective. And I think in the last panel or one of the panel before, uh, one of the panelists talked about the risk management process that um, product providers have to go through in uh, delivering, offering, and managing their products. Because uh, if you have uh, annuity contracts that are issued, you've got to make sure that your investment return as a, as, a, as a company are sufficient enough to cover the promises you've made in the policy contracts or the annuity contracts that you've made to your uh, policyholders. And so uh, that's a, a risk management process. And it's a, it's, an, it, it's a structured process that they go through. So I start to look at that, and then uh, based on my experience in, in the, um, in the uh, risk management area on a corporate side, start to draw the connection with maybe there's a parallel process for risk management from the consumer perspective. And maybe if I pull that out a little bit further, I start to look at it in terms of, is that also a way for us to establish an understanding about the consumer's perspective? And is that what the consumer is doing? Is Are they actually managing this basket of risks that they face in retirement? Um, and they need they need help to do that. And looking at the prompt with respect to, are they, are, um, Consumers becoming more proficient with technology, yes, but are they looking to buy with technology? You know, I we put out there that I think maybe a lot of consumers are, are using technology to find education and help them better manage their risks. So if I look at risk management and so what to define what it is, you start to break it down and look at what is risk, what is management, and what is risk management. But risk is, is basically, and we look at it, whether we're um, a, a risk owner or, or a risk taker as an underwriter where we're accepting risk, is risk is basically a deviation from an expected outcome, to use kind of a, a statistical term. So um, that's what people, when you're practicing risk management, you're really thinking about what are the, what are the other outcomes that are, exist out there beyond what's expected and how am I preparing for that and how am I managing that or how am I financing that? And corporates and consumers manage that by buying products a lot. Insurance is a way of managing risk. It's a way of actually financing risk. And in the insurance as a risk financing mechanism transfers risk from the risk owner to an insurance company who assumes that risk. So that's what the area of, of, of risk is. Management on the other hand is sort of a structured process. Um, and then we all learned in uh, undergraduate business school and management is plan, lead, organize, control. And that's really what management is. But for risk management, it really is a structured process of how we go through it, identifying risks, um, evaluating and measuring risks, and then looking at ways to manage or mitigate risk, whether we retain the risk or whether we transfer the risks through insurance or whatever, that's the management piece. And then we kind of have the process where we check it periodically to see how we're doing and do we need to make changes in how we do that. So just like corporates, individuals, I put forth a postulate that that's what they are doing on the consumer perspective. So I think it would be interesting to, to take a dive and look at a key risk area that all of us face, whether we look at it from a corporate side or for an individual, and to enter the world of what Raj manages in the area of cyber security, which emanates in terms of managing cyber risk. So I'll pitch it over to him and talk a little bit about how do you see that as a good example of, of risk and, and managing risk and how you see it impacting both the corporates 
yeah. and potentially, each, each, you know, extrapolating that into the consumer perspective. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, first thing is, uh, you guys are all representatives of, of companies, right? Um, do you know if you guys, uh, your companies have any cybersecurity risk in insurance? Right. So that that's that's been relatively recent, um, and it's due to the fact that there is uh, there's a lot of um, cybersecurity issues uh, currently today, um, and companies have to prove that they have the mechanisms in place to keep those risk premiums uh, down. Um, and and I feel like you know a lot of companies. Uh, just aren't doing a good enough job. Uh, it's it's a very difficult landscape to navigate. Um, you know, when you look at some of these uh, companies out there in the news, uh, there's hundreds of them. Uh, you know, back in 2013, I think Target. Do you guys remember the Target breach? Uh, anybody know uh, what happened? Wh why uh, they were breached? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a multi-billion dollar company um, and they invested hundreds of millions of dollars into their IT infrastructure, but they hired this one HVAC company from Pennsylvania, uh, Fazio uh, HVAC services or something like that. Um, and one of the representatives of that company had his credentials stolen. Uh, those credentials were used to tap into the target infrastructure and, and essentially uh, stole, you know, millions upon millions of uh, credit card information and, and, you know, the list goes on, but uh, you know, target eventually, I think all told was out like $300 million or something like that. And I think they still had to pay for the HVAC service that day too. So, uh, <laughs> but, but the point being is, um, you know, you can throw millions and millions of dollars into infrastructure and, and trying to uh, secure your, your perimeter, um, and all it takes is is one uh, one employee or or you know one endpoint. It could be an iPhone. It could be a, those dreaded desktops. I think someone was talking about desktop earlier, um, and that's all it takes. If that if that desktop is, is not properly uh, patched, um, and there's there's a way to get in, and and on you go. So um, you know that that's an issue a lot of companies face, and frankly. Um, you know, the fact that not everyone has been breached, it's because they've, they've just been lucky, I think, uh, at this point. Um, so, you know, my company, what, what we do is we, um, we, we consult on, on where those gaps are, uh, on the endpoints. Um, and, you know, my company, in, in fact, in, in North America has a, has a unique perspective because, uh, we're, we're based in Finland. So we've got you know 600 miles of, of neighboring border with 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 Russia, and so you know there's there's a lot there um, in terms of you know cybersecurity, just awareness, uh, just being in the Eastern Bloc and, and all that, and um, you know it's it's a difficult uh, landscape to, to to navigate at least on the corporate side. Um, when it comes to the consumer side, it's a, it's a little bit uh, easier, I think. Um, you know, my, my parents, they, they, they're laptop or sorry, iPad users. Um, and I, uh, as a cybersecurity professional, I, I look at them and I think to myself, okay, you know, my dad turns on his, his iPad. I, I relegate his iPad to, to one app, uh, and, and one, one application, which is, which is the, uh, the, um, uh, the Chase uh, mobile app. So he does his mobile banking. Uh, I think everyone here uh, does some sort of financial traction, uh, transactions on their phones or mobile devices, right? I mean, that's just the way the world is. Um, but you can protect yourself by um, putting in those, those um, controls to prevent things from, from getting out of hand. So I relegate his experience to one mobile app, which is the Chase app, and, and one... Uh, website to go out, which is his uh, Indian scripture that he, that he goes on. Other than that, he can't really use it all that much, um, but he has to come, he has to come to me if he wants a, uh, you know, uh, a, a new site to, to go to, right? That's just how it works. And, and the funny thing is that's basically uh, the way the world is going. And, and, you know, it's difficult to protect your firm and, and still 
maintain business uh, efficiently, right? Um, you know, some examples are uh, I worked with a with a company uh, and and you know uh, we couldn't do anything to the CEO's computer. The CEO could do whatever they wanted with with their computers, um, and it's just one of these things where unless everyone plays ball and and sort of you know adheres to the policies, you're going to have a, a situation where you know, a privileged user like a CEO may potentially get their, their um, computers uh, hacked because they're, you know, they just uh, are unwilling to potentially go with, with uh, the rest of the folks. So um, there, there's, you know, countless examples of, of, um, of that sort of stuff, which we try to consult against. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Roger. I think kind of flipping back to the consumer side um, and we look at risk um, in the, my, the last uh, professional part of my career, I was um, a, I taught in the Barney School of Business at the University of Hartford. And one of the courses that I was given to teach, I'll never forget it, was this course that had been taught for many years there. It was called social insurance. And I looked at it and I said, Okay, I can teach this, but I can't teach it the way the syllabus is, was written. So they said, we don't care, just teach the class. As long as you kind of stay within the broad parameters of the course, you can do that. So I flipped it and I taught the course from a risk management perspective and understanding risk. And it was very, very interesting because I think, uh, Susan, you asked the question about you know, how young is too young or how old is old enough to start with um, sort of understanding risk management or, or understanding financial education. And this, now, mind you, I'm dealing with 21-year-old students who are taking this class and, and they talk about, you know, they said, well, you know, I'm not too worried about retirement because I'm going to retire on my social security. And I said, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, because th they had no idea. They thought, well, th that's what you retire on, right? And I go, well, you usually can meet maybe some of your basic human needs like food, clothing, and shelter. But beyond that, that's it. To talk about your lifestyle or what you're used to, they, you're not going to cover that. And then we get into other things in terms of talking about their expectations. Well, how are you going to provide for your, your health care? Well, I'll take Medicare because that's free. <laughs> And I go like, well, um, it's, you know, it, it's, you don't know that, but it's not free. And by the way, the program is full of holes with deductibles and co-insurance and so forth. And you need a supplemental program. And so, but it was very interesting to me was that they, as prospective consumers thought, well, there were two aspects to that. One, they didn't really understand the risks that were associated with health and your health risks. And they didn't understand the risks associated with making sure, having the financial ability to sustain your lifestyle, which they all wanted to do when they approached that age, that what we typically used to call age 65. Um, yeah. I think it was more 90. It was just amazing to me, but we went through and we did that and we started to talk about that and they learned about it and they were like, OMG, what am I going to do? But they started to do it and it was interesting because I saw a distinct difference between how the millennials were responding to that than what the Gen Z were responding to that. And that was very interesting. The millennials were sort of, they were, they were angry. They, well, frankly, they were pissed off because they didn't realize they thought this was all taken care of. And now their life was like, what am I going to do? The Gen Zers were they were really upset, but they said, well, thank God I learned this now because I've got to take, I've got it some time horizon to do something about it. But that was what the, the uh, it was, it was pretty, pretty broad based. And I think that's what we, our consumers are actually doing is they're really now as they, as they age and they, and they start to think about this, but they historically have started to think about this when they were in their fifties. And it, we all know that starting to plan your retirement when you're in your fifties is not a good idea because you have a very short runway after that, before you need to be, you're going to be activating your plan. Um, and this in, and the other idea is, is understanding your health risks. It's not good to, to arrive at age 62 and be 40 pounds overweight because you've got, you're carrying this health risk around, which is not, it's not a good risk factor for you to have, or, or um, you know, maybe you, you've put off some of your 
you know, routine maintenance or you haven't had a, you know, a well visit with a physician or something. So the, the consumers, I think, are waking up to risks. And the idea, I think, is we need to start to get people to think about risks broadly. It's just, yes, it's financial risk. Yes, it's health risk. But what are you going to do to take care of yourself if you need help? Are your kids going to take you in? Can you move in with your kids if you need assistance in living or whatever? There's a whole series of things. And I think that that becomes maybe perhaps my my postulate here is that that becomes the basis for maybe having conversations with consumers to understand. And by doing so, you're providing a value added to that consumer to helping them. They go, oh, I didn't understand that. Now, thank you. I understand how that works. That it really becomes a way to build that trust in that, you know, that, that, um, uh, Evelina, how did you describe uh, the the solution with uh, transparency and trust and 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 having that, that that relationship? And that provides the basis versus saying you got to buy this 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 whole life insurance policy because it's got a cash value feature that you really will appreciate in your in your older years. And people go like, I'm not sure I understand the difference between term life and whole life, and and it and it, it gets into that. So that's sort of the postulate that I put out there in terms of risk management, that it can become a platform to help consumers, help them. And I, and I think maybe that that's what they're doing when they're starting to navigate the, you know, through technology is to get information and educate themselves. They're not necessarily going to buy on the first click or with the first connection they make, but they're going to buy, I think, because you've established trust when you <laughs> teach them something and they go, oh, oh. I trust Evelina because she explained it to me and now I know how it works and I know there's options and that's what I'm looking for, a flexibility. So I, and you know, okay, I know it has a cost to it, but I'm really looking for some other things besides that. So that's kind of what I put out there that risk management could potentially become a way to have um, a conversation with consumers and help them make inform decisions and add value to them and get, and help them deal with this the multitude of risks that are out there in the ecosystem all you know compounded with vuca paul you know volatility uncertainty and all that so yeah <laughs> Well, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I think um, uh, in, insurance in particular is, uh, is a very human business. Um, and it's not like going on Amazon and buying a pair of gloves, right? There's, a, there's an empathy factor involved, right? There's a, a sort of a trusted advisor uh, part that you need to play if you're making any type of advice. Um, so it's, you know, the, the person that's actually, um, you know, shopping for, some type of annuity online or, or some type of insurance product online, uh, you know, that they want to be an informed uh, con consumer, but they're not going to know everything. And um, the way that you could tap into that, uh, that human spirit is by just, in my mind, uh, sh you know, showing that empathy and, and being that sort of trusted advisor. And most of the time, a parent's going to look to their child, um, you know, or, uh, it's funny, when I first started out of college, I was selling annuities for Merrill. Uh, this was back in like 96. Um, and, and I was that, somebody termed it the baby broker, but I was the baby broker. And I was what, 24? I mean, who the hell's gonna listen to a 24 year old about annuities? Um, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't probably make as many sales as I would like because I didn't have enough gray hair. But I, I could sell the, the crap out of annuities now. Look at all this gray hair I have on this. <laughs> you know, but back then. So like, I guess it's just making sure that um, you do as much as you can to be on the, on the same side of the table as, 
as that uh, person that's um, you know looking to buy uh, in, in insurance. I, the, on the on the corporate side of things, one one thing that um, I I love about the innovation is is the the automation built into the user experience. Um, but again, you need to have uh, that that human factor as well. Like at a certain point. The, the automatic process or the bots or whatever you guys uh, uh, enable to, to make the process go faster, that goes to a certain point. And then you need to have that human, human interaction, that trusted advisor that's gonna kind of close the loop on, on the sale, uh, if you will. Because um, outside of that, I, I'm not sure how uh, you, can, you can move much um, product with, without that human interaction. But. You know? Yeah, I think the human interaction is important. Yeah. Barbara, you had your hand. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I hear you. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. About, you know, sure. Emotional health, too, <laughs> like all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a very good idea because I think to use the parallel, we've gotten more comfortable with health risk assessments. I mean, a lot of employers want to do that because it keeps their costs down, but it really also, it does help provide you as a consum consumer protection because it, it makes you think about, you know, how many drinks did I have this week? Um, <laughs> and it, it, that, don't ask me that. <laughs> um, or, you know, do, and did I quit? Yeah, I quit smoking. So don't worry about that. But, but then getting some of those like diagnostic, you know, did you get a colonoscopy and, and have you had one in 10 years? And, and those questions like that are very helpful. But I think there is a sort of a financial well-being perspective on that. And, you know, Susan, yesterday at your um, summit, you, you had a breakout and I, the wind went to healthy, wealthy, and wise. And it was pr pretty interesting because it really, and it sort of took a whole step back where the panelists were all basically saying, well, we all use, we all used to be insurance company people, but now we're, now we're in the healthcare field, which was very interesting, but they still were working for actually many insurance organizations in health space have migrated from being, they don't identify as an insurance company. They identify themselves as a healthcare company. I mean, if we look at, you know, Aetna up the street being bought by CVS, we see Cigna buying Express Scripts, you know, now they try to, they talk about cost, quality, access, uh, equity, and population health. And they say that, and they, that's how they fit in. And when I worked at Cigna, when I started, it was like, well, you know, how fast can we pay a claim was a metric that was important. And then how fast can we get an ID card out correctly, which was a big, which always was a challenge. But it was sort of, that was the big thing about the business. And now it's very different. And I think it, you can take that concept and flip it, Barbara, like you suggested. And I think that that's a great way of, of having that sort of financial risk assessment. So, yes. Correct. <clears throat> yeah, I think addressing them is different. And I think that's why we have to have, I think, the distinction there because they're different. The risks are not all... Um, alike and they move in different directions at different times simultaneously. And, but then sometimes they're integrated, like sometimes a health risk can create a financial catastrophe. I mean, who would, our, my grandparents would never have believed that uh, uh, having healthcare costs could have put you into bankruptcy. You know, they thought it would have been a burden or they wouldn't have gotten it, but they wouldn't have thought about the economic impact. And today, that's a reality. So I think that that's important to understand that. Raj, I don't know that you think differently. Uh, well, I mean, from a, again, from a, the cybersecurity perspective, um, 
you know, we have, we have a term called privileged users, right? That's sort of like the folks that need to keep the lights on in the business, the administrators, right? They're the, they hold the keys to the kingdom, right? They hold access to all the PII that, that you guys are trying to protect uh, and that you guys look at to, to make your next sale, right? Um, and, you know, that is, that's a huge risk to corporations, uh, being able to, to pick the right individual uh, to, to have those keys is super important in, in the process, um, you know, the, the process of, of picking the right individuals to manage the, the network. Um, I mean, that, that's an inherent risk uh, for, for all companies. Um, I, I feel like, you know, when it comes to cybersecurity risk, uh, it's, it's multifaceted, but it starts with um, every single employee how they interact with, with the data, um, you know, what their intent is. When you hire someone, uh, you, you have the best intentions for them to, to be like an equitable piece of the organization. But there are those disgruntled employees. Um, there, there are those employees that, uh, you know, uh, take a wrong turn and, and you know, try to uh, instill malicious activity. Um, and that this is, this is where, where my firm, uh, comes, comes in, in terms of being able to provide that next generation, uh, protection against malware or, or any type of, uh, internal, internal or external threats. Um, and we do that. It, it, it's, it's changed so much, but the, the biggest thing that a, a lot of cybersecurity firms out there particularly around the insurance industry when selling to insurance uh, companies is the, the behavioral aspect of, of protecting um, firms and, and uh, against cybersecurity threats. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, every single employee um, has a certain behavior when they, when they work, when they interact with uh, company materials, right? And if that employee or that workstation that they're constantly using deviates from that behavior, that sets off a behavioral anomaly, uh, a trigger that essentially says, hey, look into this, um, look into this activity. Uh, this is atypical to, to this employee's behavior, right? So that's kind of where cybersecurity is going. It's around the behavioral, uh, you know, to use a, an overused term, AI, the, the, the data-driven uh, aspect of protecting networks because it's, it's not um, what it was like 15 years ago where you just looked at a list of signatures or a list of definitions and, and that was it. Things have, have changed. The landscape has changed so much. So, um, you know, I encourage every, every representative uh, of a company that, that's here today to just kind of understand those, those types of risks out there um, I mean, how many people actually interact with, with their technical teams? Um, oh, good. A lot. Right. So, um, you, you understand the, the concerns that are out there. Um, and you know, especially around the insurance industry where you guys hold so much PII brand recognition is huge. Right. Uh, and all it takes is, is one massive breach and, you know, you go the way Target did 10 years ago. Um, I don't know if they've fully recovered, uh, but um, Absolutely, you, at, at Yale New Haven. Yeah, yeah. I, I work in the. I want really <laughs> Yeah, and there, there, it, it, the occurrence is almost daily. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's not just ransomware. I mean, everyone knows ransomware, but it's not just ransomware anymore. Uh, you know, the advent of of cryptocurrency is causing um, more and more uh, attempted attacks because it's just easy to, to send over some, some Bitcoin. Um, I've always said, you know, all it takes to actually have a successful breach is, is time and energy, right? So what, what we've tried to do is prevent that, um, you know, lessen the time of an attack, um, lessen the, the, the effort of, of an attack, uh, and then maybe you won't, um, it won't occur as much. Your study would be the monitoring costs is bearable. Yeah. The monitoring uh, of, of, the, of the networks. Yeah, I mean, there's, so there's two ways, uh, and, and this is another direction for, for anyone who is really interested in 
uh, where cybersecurity, uh, the industry is going. Um, it's going in the direction of, okay, you, you have an internal team that manages cybersecurity risk through a tool set that you've purchased, right? But then that team needs an out. They need a, a set of trusted uh, advisors. We call them white hat, white hat hackers, right? Uh, a channel, uh, a phone that uh, if they can't figure out what's going on, there is a service that sort of is their backstop, right? So that's another thing we've built into our program at With Secure is not only do we have uh, the front, not only do our customers have that front end application that helps monitor everything, but if in a situation, a company's internal team can't figure out what's going on, they can elevate the uh, instance to our white hat hackers um, in, in Finland. And that's another set of professional eyes that can, can help out with, with an impending attack. Maybe it would have helped. Uh, what is Yeah. Right. Uh, you have a pro you have a program. That's a good question. I mean, I I think cybersecurity firms I've been with, you know, four in the last 10 years, uh, that's never come up uh, in terms of embedding the insurance. Uh, I think that's just another can of worms that they don't want to, yeah. Well, no, it's a great idea. But what I can say, um, the, the last firm I worked at, uh, just the name itself uh, lowered risk premiums for customers uh, because they were so well known in the industry. So. That's, that's something, um, but I, I feel like the, what, what's going on now with everyone working from home and, and hybrid, uh, hybrid workforce and you know, folks using their own personal computers to tap into corporate networks, um, the BYOD uh, piece to, to the pie, uh, I feel like the systems need to be put into place to, to mitigate any risk. So if you've got, uh, if your company allows a personal uh, device, to access corporate networks, there has to be a secure tunnel to get into that corporate data, right? These are small things that will absolutely lessen cybersecurity insurance. And the big thing, I know with the, ins uh, with the educational um, uh, enterprises, uh, they need to have some type of endpoint detect and respond. What I was talking about, the behavioral analysis that allows companies to sort of understand if, if there's any um, you know, mischievous anomalous behavior going on in, in the network, just that alone will, will lower, will lower the premiums. It's called, it's called, um, next generation protection. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, that's a great idea. I know well, co <laughs> companies do that internally, but they make a mistake. So they're, they're called development, uh, uh, pods or development instances, right. Where you have your production, your production data. That's where, you know, the, the PII, the legitimate client data goes back and forth. But then in order to test certain scenarios, they have a quarantined area. It's a development area. Problem is, I've seen companies take that development area, which is sort of a sandbox, and they have a leg into the production, which is a no-no, right? So, like when when you apply for cybersecurity insurance, that's the type of stuff that they look at. Um, and you know, if if you have certain failures, then you're you may not get the insurance, or the premiums are going to be super high. But I bet Amazon's working on that right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean. They've got eight, they got AWS. I mean, it's interesting yeah, yeah, to yeah. think about that. That's a, that is a great idea though. I think that that's the type of thing, but that's the type of thing. I just want to flip back because we had a very interesting discussion uh, uh, in the last panel and, and after the, between panels about time value of money education. 
and how it's, you know, that understanding the compounding uh, interest and how it works and, and, and that. I'm just going to pick on one person here, and that's Allison, in terms of how do you feel about as a rising young professional about your preparation and or the interest or the preparation of your, um, your colleagues in terms of understanding your long game. I mean, it's not the next five years, it's the next 50 years. Um, how, how, does, does that ever come across your, um, your thinking or is that sort of like, I'll worry about that tomorrow? That's great. That's great. So I, I think that that really shows the value of education and understanding that. And you, you have to start thinking about it when you're in your 20s. You don't wait until you're 58 to, to start to do something about it because it's very difficult to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, th th thanks so much. And uh, our next topic... Very interesting, I, I would say, if we had a PNC panel discussion on climate change, climate risk, it's, oh, I know what this is gonna be about. But we're talking about annuities. And it's, it's interesting, um, we're gonna do a little bit of tech change here. We have a, a virtual moderator or panelist coming in here. So, <laughs> so we're gonna see how this all works. Um, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information about this company and other great startups at imagine.nfg.com.